I'm praying to you. Look into your zombie takeout. I'm praying to you. Welcome to episode 204 of Zombie Take Out, the B movie and cult movie podcast. I'm Uncle John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some news. We haven't had some in a while. Yeah, all right. First story from The Hollywood Reporter. Glenn Mazzara prepping Omen follow-up for a lifetime. <laughs> I did see that headline online. <laughs> Just, What? <laughs> The former Walking Dead showrunner is developing a follow-up to the 1976 horror classic For a Lifetime, titled Damien. The drama centers around the film's young boy, Damien Thorne, now an adult and haunted by his past. Damien is faced with a series of macabre events and must finally face his true destiny. He is the Antichrist. For a Lifetime, Damien marks a dramatic shift from the typical female-skewing fare the cable network has become known for. The cable art more recently has been pushing further into the increasingly popular genre territory with the witchy drama Witches of East End, as opposed to Eastwick, I suppose, That's now terrible. in its second season, and with dystopian thriller The Lottery on deck. Now, I wow. haven't seen Witches of East End. I'm not that interested. It sounds uh, like a British version of the Nicholson movie. How do you go there? Um. Yeah. The Lottery, it's dystopian, which is inter- always interesting to me. But the Damien thing, um, Lifetime. I just can't see it. I really can't see them doing horror. Right. The whole point of that network, things are, are just, you know, it's juicy, but it's usually watered down, you know? It's yes. synonymous for watered down. Uh, well, you know. Yeah, that and Hallmark, yeah. Right. Well, Hallmark is just complete, mm. you know, glitter and, and you know, <laughs> pixie dust. <laughs> But Lifetime is usually, you know, a very special Lifetime movie. Right. You know, it's supposed to be something, a tearjerker, or just, you know, watered down. Right. So I don't see how horror translates to that audience. They're either going to try to tailor it to their audience. Or alienate their audience. I can't see it being any good if they tailor it to their audience. And if they really push it where it needs to be, it's it's going to kill them. Or it's, it's not going to kill them. It's going to last three episodes. NBC's doing Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, this... I, I, that was actually the beginning of the story. I cut that part out. Um, yeah. I mentioned Hannibal and Rosemary's Baby and some other stuff. And I've heard Hannibal gets pretty intense, too. I, I do hear Hannibal gets intense. I, I've seen maybe bits and pieces of it. I haven't... Uh... But again, this is Lifetime and, and the adult Antichrist, which kind of castrates the story a bit, because... The whole thing about the omen was it was a kid. Yeah, that was well, that was part of the appeal. There are sequels where mm-hmm. which I'm, we actually I guess should do the omen somewhere yeah, down to. the line sooner or later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe not the original, but maybe some of those yeah. sequels where the they're a bit cheesier. Kind of a classic. Yes, it is. Yeah, Donald Sutherland. Yeah, it doesn't really suit us. It'd be like doing The Exorcist. But the, the sequels, from what I remember, are pretty damn cheesy. Uh, starring a Mr. Sam Neill. Oh my. As, you know, the grown up Damien. I, did, I haven't seen any of the sequels. They did the grown up Damien. Yes, yes, they did. <laughs> I think it's the first thing I remember ever seeing Sam Neill in, actually. <laughs> so this is really just a rehash of the sequels. Although the article did say they were distancing themselves from the sequels, they, they kind of rehashed the idea. And Well, it just means they're going to completely. You know, redo it, you know. Yeah, it's a remake of the sequels. Um, yeah. But think about that for a second, a remake of a sequel. I know. Do you, do you remember I wrote, like, a uh, a futuristic kind of dystopian short story back in the yes, day? Yes, And one of the lines of it was, like, uh, a remake. We're going to go see the remake of the classic Week of the Weapon 3. Yeah, yeah. Was I not on the mark? <laughs> <laughs> it's looking that way from this, yeah. 
<laughs> I remember the creative writing teacher came up to me. It wasn't my teacher either. Uh-huh. It was one that we both knew. Yeah. And was just kind of like, ah, oh, you're just full of shit. You wouldn't get away with any of that speculative shit in my class, I think was the exact one. Those were his exact words. Still remember I, that, what, 20 years later? I should send him a copy of the story now. <laughs> and have him read it and ask him, how speculative was it? <laughs> Because we're there, man. Yeah. (laughs) Right there. All right, next story. This is from io9. Here's the first new Star Wars Episode Seven Alien, and it's not CG. Oh, boy. J.J. Abrams' latest video comes straight from the set of Star Wars Episode Seven, where we get to see a new alien creature, one that uses practical effects. Even if this is just a background character, this is hopefully a sign that we'll be seeing a return to costumed and puppet aliens in the new Star Wars movies and less of a reliance on CG characters. It looked like a character from Dark Crystal. It did. Which is kind of a good sign. It also kind of looked like a character from Phantom Menace, too. Just like something in the background. Yeah, yeah I suppose. Um, like I'm One just... of the fellow pod racers. Yeah, yeah. I'm just glad to see practical effects in a Star Wars movie. Yeah, that's cool. I really, though, would prefer to just see it in the movie. Not to sound like a (laughs) (laughs) fuddy-duddy. But, you know, I really don't give a fuck about spoilers and want to find out everything about a movie before going to see it. I want to see the movie. And in the story, and it'll be in the show notes, of course. Yeah. There's a, a bit of a spiel that he does for this charity called The Force for Change. And he says that he's filming from Abu Dhabi. Which means we were once again going back to Tatooine. Of course. I think Luke is finally going to get to pick up those power converters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on to this week's movie, which is from 1990, Miller's Crossing. And of course, the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by period dialogue. Confusing as hell and most likely inaccurate, but at least it sounds cool. And also brought to you by hats. Hi, or just not to be forgotten. <laughs> Or chased. Or chased after. <laughs> All right. So we have a uh, a gangster in the Irish mob from a um, – they keep the town very generic, the, the setting very generic. You just know it's some time back in the Prohibition era. and it's uh, a city somewhere. It's a mid-sized city, I guess. Somewhere I mean, in the Midwest, I'm guessing. Maybe, right, right. Although I don't know about Irish and Italian populations in the, in the Midwest. Midwest. Good point. But though, I don't, you know, although, I mean, Chicago, of course, had it. <laughs> they shot it in um, Louisiana, in New Orleans specifically. That makes sense. It did It did have kind of that feel to it. So um, that's why I said it felt Midwest. But nobody had an accent. So mm-hmm. right. it was, um, except, of course, Irish people. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of Irish people. Yeah, a couple of Irish people. So we have this gangster. He's, uh, it's not about the Godfather, of course. Mm-hmm. It's about the guy giving advice to the godfather not even the consulier uh, the just um a well, good advisor in the plot, plot summary it does call him the consigliere really yeah. usually that's like a a lawyer or something well maybe i'm just thinking from the godfather movies <laughs> but anyway he's just his chief advisor and um he uh, he advises him not to get into a war which of course Duh. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you, you know, if you have a peaceful resolution to something, uh, war, in, in, at least in their sense, is not a profitable thing. No. So why bother getting involved? Well, the complications are that the person that they want to get rid of is their mutual girlfriend's brother. <laughs> they don't know. Well, one the, of his, his advisor knows. Mm-hmm. But of course, the godfather does not know that they are both seeing the same girl. Mm. And, uh, yeah, her brother has been, um, well, you know what? They don't even really establish if he was doing it. They're not even really 100% sure. Well, he says it himself. He got that's, that information and he had to. That's right. He does say it. he just had to make money like anybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, he's, he's finding out, uh, this other mobsters, uh, throne fights, mm-hmm. And taking bets and skimming off of his money, pretty much. Taking down, cutting a piece out of his action. Yeah, adjusting the odds. Getting some for himself. Mm. Um, Of course, fueling a lot of the hatred against him 
you, there there's a very strong anti-Semitic element mm-hmm. in the film, and you know, the, the, with the person who is doing the skimming being Jewish, yeah. uh, very one of the the only few in the entire town, it would seem, and uh, and possibly so, his lover. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Suggested that he is. Yeah, they're they're not quite sure they're, they're but then again, back then any well they, yeah, they no they were that. definitely a couple. I, it suggested that Mink is Jewish, but not necessarily confirmed. But they're definitely a couple. Yeah. So um, they they it's a sensitive issue, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the Godfather just won't look weak to this other mobster and give in to his will, mm-hmm. and and get rid of this guy who's been skimming. So the war starts, things get very ugly, and uh, it's eventually brought to light that his advisor is uh, actually only brought forth by himself, being honest, when he's saying he's going to marry this girl. (laughs) Not to do it, because she was with me. (laughs) So that leads to a big fight, and pushes him out of his mob he becomes a free agent, and I think probably the most unrealistic part of the entire movie would be he just joins <laughs> the other mob. Most unrealistic among many unrealistic parts of the movie. Now, maybe it's, it's you know, they, they would overlook him being Irish when it's an Italian mob well, that yes. he's joining. <laughs> but maybe you could also say that um, the this other mobster was smart to bring him forth as an advisor since he was he knows the inside information since what he did was so good he was so good at what he did the problem is of course how do you ever know if he's really his loyalties are on the up and up it just wouldn't be worth it which brings us to the rest of the plot right which brings us to the rest of the plot because he's you know the the soldier inside the trojan horse (laughs) uh whether he's intentionally doing it or not, he is just, you know, driving a wedge into the entire, his entire outfit and dragging him down. And really, you could say, uh, hilarity ensues. Yes, yeah. being yeah. honest. Now, this is our first dramatic movie by the Coen Brothers, and one of the few that I've seen. I'm much more familiar with the comedies. I gotta say, I was a little disappointed by the tone. It doesn't feel like a Coen's movie. Really. Because even their dramas, even No Country for All Ben, which is very serious, feels like a Coen's movie. It's still got that quirkiness to it. There's really no quirk in this one. Yeah, I guess with the exception... There's of, a few shots here and there, but that's it. Of the uh, the beatdown scene, mm-hmm. which was hilarious. Uh, the, the scene with the kid and the dog and the corpse was very Coen's. Yeah, yeah. Also when um, Leo escapes from his house when it's on fire with the machine gun, that was really oh. Coen's. I I love that. <laughs> that was probably <laughs> the best part of the movie. <laughs> that, that whole sequence, or just you can just call it the Danny Boy mm-hmm. uh, sequence. Yeah, that, that just. <laughs> but on the whole, it's a very it, it's well made. All the performances are rock solid. It looks great, but it's a very sort of generic gangster movie in a lot of ways. It's very strange because I was thinking about this. Uh, Last week we did a movie that was really hardcore into its time that it was made. Yeah. This movie, if you, if we didn't say it was made in 1990 before watching it, mm-hmm. it could have been made any time yeah. between the late 20s and now. Right. It doesn't attach itself to any particular period in its – I mean, obviously it's set in Prohibition era, but in terms of right. how it was made, you, yeah, it's very um, – I want to go back to generic again, or, or not generic, but but nondescript. That's a better word. Yeah, they keep a lot of it vague, mm-hmm. and it's it feels like it was intentionally done that way. Like you don't even know what what city this is or anything like that. And of course, it has to be a mid level city because the the mayor and the police chief are very much just lapdogs to whichever outfits in power. Mm-hmm. So yeah, everything is kept just. I mean, they're not going for historical accuracy. Right. They're just uh, serving up a vague story. Mm. Uh, and one that was a bit hard to follow, not only because of the period dialogue as I got to in my sponsor, but also it was kind of convoluted and unfocused. 
I thought the dialogue for a period piece... It sold the period, but it made it hard to follow for me. I thought, I thought they actually toned it down. I, there's so many people that would have exaggerated the dialogue even mm-hmm. more so than yeah. that, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. I thought they kept the accent light, which I think they even had Gabriel Byrne do. Well, the accents weren't bad. Just, just the, the, the terminology. Which, you know, they were worse with in um, Hudsuckers, but that's a comedy. You can yeah. get away with it. In a drama, I get they want to sell the period, but it still makes it a little hard to understand. Especially when you have a plot that is constantly twisting and turning and has a lot of side elements that don't really matter, but they still throw in to kind of lead you astray. Yeah. Because this the whole thing is, is a big sleight of hand trick. Right. Because you're not supposed to see what uh, Tom, uh, Gabriel Byrne's character, is doing until the big reveal at the end. Except there were, I think there were a few moments that kind of gave it away a little bit. When he made the deal with Mink, I kind of got the feeling he was trying to take down, um, what was his name, the Italian boss? Uh, Casper. Casper. I, had, I got the feeling when he made the deal with Mink that he was trying to take down Casper. And, and another great, solid John Polito. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He was brilliant. I <laughs> always love watching him. And and when Casper threw the drink tray in the in the mayor's office and kind of you know got up in his face a bit, you could see in his eyes that he Casper was going down. I mean, you're just watching this Machiavellian uh, plot take place. It's mm. it's very Shakespearean. It's uh, for for a gangster movie. It is actually when you were describing the plot, it kind of put me in mind of a lot of the Greek tragedies. Right. You know the 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 king who refused to to show any weakness and ended up getting burned for it. Exactly, and then just you know hijinks instead of you know the usual tragedy. Right, right. <laughs> Although Gabriel Byrne as a gangster really put me in mind the usual suspects. Oh yeah, he kind of plays that same guy whenever he's a gangster. Well, this is before Usual Suspects, of course. Well, yeah, but wait, was it? Oh yeah. What was Usual Suspects? Usual Suspects was like uh, mid to late 90s. Was it? Because I saw it at OCC. I saw it in like 95. And it was on video at the time. But this was 1990. It could have been after, but it couldn't have been that much after. Usual Suspects was 95. Okay. So it was, yeah, around the time. I, I pro- probably went straight to video when I saw it. So it was like five years after after this. But Byrne has done some brilliant work, but obviously when he plays a gangster, he has one speed. <laughs> So that that was kind of amusing. I was waiting for someone to call him Keaton. I, I mean, the crazy thing, the usual suspect, he wanted to be the star of it. They didn't know about the ending. Right. And he didn't like it because he wanted to be right. Kaiser Cersei. Yeah. But for this, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's just such a a low key performance. Mm-hmm. But it's I don't get bored of it. I wouldn't say I got bored. I got a little distracted, and it just. I don't know. It there was really just nothing special about it for me. Is is the problem? I mean, it was very well made, just nothing special. And there were some glaring moments of of unrealism, <laughs> like you were talking about with with um, Tom getting into the Italian mob. Also, when they went to look for the body, yeah. Or, or oh, no, roll that back. When he supposedly killed um, Bernie. Well, right. Wouldn't they go checking for the body right then and there? Maybe dispose of it. Well, that's what the what the Dane said <laughs> when he found out. Mm. He was like, wait a minute, you guys didn't even go and look? What the fuck is wrong with you people? And not even go look, because obviously you've got a questionable party pulling the trigger. Right. You're just going to leave it there? I mean, okay, it, it's a long time ago, but still, leaving a body in the middle of the woods is going to get found when somebody disappears. Also, when Bernie was pleading for his life and kept saying, what was the line? Look at Tia hot. I'm praying to you. I'm praying to you. He said it like five times in a row. Oh, yeah. I would have shot him at that point, just to <laughs> shut him up. <laughs> if the mansion fire scene, the Danny boy scene, as you referred to it, yes. if that's the best part of the movie, which I agree, Bernie pleading for his life is the worst. Really? That is like, I mean, God, as far as performance-wise. It's just, the repetition just irritated the shit out of me. <laughs> Well, he's an irritating guy. See, he doesn't seem that irritating when he comes back. Well, of course not. Because that's the first time we really see him is when he's being taken out and supposedly killed. Right. 
when he comes back, I kind of liked him. <laughs> he was a very, and and I say it doesn't have the Cohen flair, but but Bernie, when he comes back, is a very Cohen character. Oh yeah, and just the tension between him and Gabriel Byrne is just fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> The few scenes between those two after he came back were really high points for me as well, especially right. the first scene. And that's why that whole dramatic scene of him pleading to him for his life, and then when he comes back, it's just, <laughs> just like, wow, I would fucking shoot him right there in the <laughs> living room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't give a fuck what the cops say. Because his first scene back, he makes it abundantly clear to Tom that he has him by the ball. Yes. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. I'm still alive. I own your ass. Well, just the whole, well, what do I have now? I, You know, I left town, but, you know, I didn't have anything. And now, you know, I figured, you know, now you, I can come back and you have to, like, give me stuff to, you know, keep me happy. And <laughs> What? Though I was just as surprised as Tom, I think, to see the body when they went back. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't even see this before, and I was kind of like, "How the fuck does he get out of this?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what? What is? The... Oh, that's right. Poor Mink. Well, because Bernie doesn't want to be found out; otherwise, he's gonna lose his his puppet. Well, and they'll just come after him. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> like, like that, that whole threat would just be like, "All right, so you reveal yourself to be alive. What happens after they get me?" <laughs> and with regard to Tom's plan in the movie and how much of a plan it was, there was an interesting line that I caught when he's talking to Verna, and he says, it isn't easy, is it, with regard to shooting someone, because she, she was about to shoot him. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe he just couldn't shoot Bernie, and the rest he just played by ear. It, It's a very good possibility. <laughs> because up until that line, I assumed that this was the plan from Go, and he plotted every step out but he it's also quite clear that he's a quite a fuck up himself oh yeah yeah. You know, he owes what i forget how much money it was even for depression era hundreds of dollars if not even a thousand fifteen hundred i believe fifteen hundred which back then is kind of insane yes it'd be quite now and that, like, you know, the Godfather was willing to pay for him, Leo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who knew Albert Finney was still alive, by the way? <laughs> Is he still alive now? I, his IMDb didn't have a death okay. date. I wasn't sure. I hadn't really heard anything, but okay. I, I had assumed he was not. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, he, who offered to pay it for him, but he wanted to, you know, earn his own way, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right. Another cliche. And then the scene where he gets roughed up by the, the people that owe him are priceless, too. Yeah. Because they're just like, you know, he says, you know, it's not personal or anything. It's just business. But, you know, he knew you understood that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I did like the, the, the sort of commonplace approach that they had. Kind of, you know, just it's another day. I'm just they all did, something. though, didn't they? That, yeah. that That's what was really Cohen about the whole thing. Yeah. Was yeah. the, uh, you know, when the police would come and raid. And, you know, he would just go out and share a drink with the chief right, while right. the shit was hitting the fan. And they're just the chief just kind of like, ah, oh, man, all this waste. Why are we doing this? And he's just like, ah, you know. And and I, I should point out, if I'm not mistaken, this was their second film. Oh, uh, I hadn't thought of that. No, this is like right after Raising Arizona. Was it? OK. Yeah. Because they said from the makers of Blood Simple, I thought it was much earlier. So, okay, I was going to say maybe they hadn't quite developed their style, but if it was after Raising Arizona, yeah, which it is was their, late 80s, yeah. It is their third film. If it was after Raising Arizona, they definitely had a, had their style together in Raising Arizona. And it's the one be, they did right before Barton Fink. Which, again, very, very Cohen. Yeah. So they had their, their signatures. They just chose not to use them in this one. How sick. Fargo was like their sixth movie. Huh. And then Lebowski. Damn. <laughs> and even though I saw Arizona in the late 80s, I didn't really know of them as the Coens until Fargo. I'm trying to think of when I knew them as the Coen. Probably after Miller's Crossing, I think. Like, wow, these are the same guy that did Racing Arizona. <laughs> this looks fucking awesome. I hadn't even really heard of this movie until the last few years. Yeah, it's definitely made its, you know, 
it it was just very obscure in the nine in ninety, mm -hmm. and it, yeah, it was only the last few years that that it's it's gotten its due props. I think. Yeah. Now, Bernie is referred to several times as a schmada. Oh yes, schmada is a Yiddish word for an old rag, and also used colloquially as a label for things of poor quality or anything worthless. Casper's use is derogatory, labeling Bernie as useless both as a man and as a Jew. Right, and they also the 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 word sheeny appears. I was wondering how uh, more politically correct ears <laughs> Again, <laughs> hear that. We were talking about the homophobia in Men at Work. Also, um, apparently, ninety was a little more racist than we are now. <laughs> it is actually before the entire political correctness yeah. even made it into the vernacular. Well, I mean, yeah, it wasn't until the whole PC movement really came, started with Clinton. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's just a couple years before that. Incidentally, the Coen's cast family and friends in minor roles. Albert Finney also appears in a brief cameo as an elderly female ladies' room attendant. <laughs> and I know the exact scene they're talking about. I need to go back and check it. I think I do, too. Well, there's only now, one scene in a ladies' room. So, anyway, the, the politically incorrectness of it, though. Does it distract or does it add realism? I think it adds realism, personally. It it does, doesn't it? I mean, to to me, I, it actually distracted me personally. But on the other hand, it caught my attention, but I wouldn't say it distracted me. And and you know, what? I think what what troubled me about it was that I completely did not remember any of that being in the movie. Ah. So back when I saw this in 1990, none of that meant anything to me. That's interesting. Because the first time they used that slur on him, not Shimada, the other one. Yeah. Uh, it really caught my attention. <laughs> right. But yeah, I now see it like 24 well, years yeah, later. Yeah, these days that will catch your attention. And I don't know if it, I don't know what my mindset about that sort of thing in 90 was. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe it went over my head. Maybe I didn't even know what it meant back then. Because mm. I think the, the whole, the Sheeny thing, if I remember right, I I think I first remember that from... I think it was a clerks thing, or clerks too. Okay, I know I've heard the term before, but I can really trace it. I think it was something Randall used. Good of them. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think of it. it was something to do with Kevin Smith, and I was just kind of like, really? That's that's a thing. <laughs> but sure enough, it is. <laughs> now, on to the ending, which I also have an issue with. You know, now Tom takes out uh, Casper. And Bernie. And he just installs Leo back in. And then he's offered his old job back. And he walks away. If he just wanted out, why did he go through all that? <laughs> you know, I was kind of confused by that, too. And also, okay, why didn't he just take the city for himself? And maybe he doesn't want the responsibility. I can understand that. They should have established that. But... You know, if he's just going to walk away, why did you go through all the shit? But it's the thing. You you get no insight to what he's thinking. Mm -mm. We have no idea uh, what the fuck he's even thinking of doing. Like, where he's going to go. If he's not going to take his old job back. <laughs> like, I, what would you do then? I think that's... And I just realized, that's how they get away with the magic trick. You don't really ever get his perspective. No, he's the protagonist, but it's not told from his point of view. No. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know whose point of view it actually is we're, we're hearing it from. Whether it's fairly we're omniscient, but... Well, yeah, yeah, it's an, it's an omniscient sort of thing. Well, yeah. except that we don't know what the fuck he's thinking. Yeah. Omniscient would mean we would know what he's thinking. That's true. And, of course, movies, that's a little trickier to fall off than a book, but... Yeah. Still, you, you generally get some exposition here and there from the main character explaining to you where their head is at. You don't I get mean, that in this one. I could formulate what I think, you know, mm -hmm. happened here. Yeah. That he, you know, was just trying to do the right thing, because that's what he always does. Mm -hmm. And then probably intended to just get his old job back and and torpedo the other outfit and by the time it all happened he just said fuck it 
and by the time you know he got the taste for of blood and all that on him mm-hmm. and just was fuck it in the end <laughs> i i think i'm done with this yeah you know makes sense at, at, it makes gonna, as much sense as anything if you know leo's gonna just think with his dick and not you yeah. know put the entire city into consideration right. or or his own own outfit and, and you know throw everything away just for a chick who's you know cheating on him right. that he knows is cheating on him <laughs> Even after he finds out, he's still with her, yeah, yeah. and he's still gonna go through with it. Uh, that he's not worth the to go back and work for, right? But of it's, course, it's a good possibility. Yeah, he, he's just a guy you can't fuck with, <laughs> especially while he's listening to opera. <laughs> oh, do we mention the uh, the the other beatdown scene? Which one specifically? I, I guess we hit to that. It was just the um, the he's in the chair. He it's the first time he was offered uh, the job, pretty much from the other outfit, uh-huh. and he you know turns it down, mm. which I guess added to the credibility of him not of him joining in the end. Or at least made him more desirable. But just the the goon walking, you know, taking off his coat and walking up to him. And just like, wait, hold on. And so he gives him a chance to take yeah. off his hat and coat. Well, that's what I meant by, you know, how, um, you know, kind of, you know, matter of fact, everything was with the beatdowns. Well, it got more it was, matter of fact. It was that. business. But just the entire, like, taking the chair and hitting the other guy in the face. Yeah. yeah. And just the, Jesus. <laughs> okay, yes, now I remember the scene, yeah. I had, um... The the version I was wa- <clears throat> version I was watching this originally mm-hmm. was very choppy and, and shitty, and I had to stop after that because it it skipped before like him hitting the guy with the chair. So I watched the scene a, a few times actually before I had a new <clears throat> version, mm-hmm. and uh, I could actually see the choreography of just just so matter of fact <laughs> this business like batter up swing with the chair in the face. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's that, done it several times, obviously. Ah, pure Cohen's. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that's pretty much my notes. All right, on to sequels and remakes. Haven't been any sequels. Of really course. couldn't be any sequels. Um, I couldn't see it, yeah. No. Nobody's remade it yet. A remake set in present day could be interesting. Just to see how they would recast things. And I don't mean actor-wise. I mean recast the prejudices and sort of the you know how everything works. I don't know. In a way, this is a remake of either... It's more of a remake of a Shakespearean yeah, play. Yeah, true. So to remake it again... Yeah, I suppose so. I just want to see a version without all the jargon. It <laughs> has to have the jargon, though. <laughs> yeah, I guess. You can't have a, a gangster film without the jargon. All right, on to brains. On to brains. I think you may have talked me up when you mentioned that we never get Tom's perspective. Because that's a hell of a trick. <laughs> I think that's the one thing I remembered from this movie. You had no idea what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> to, to be able to do that with the main character without it being blatantly obvious is a hell of a magic trick, so... I'm going up a half. I, I'm giving it a four. And honestly, even watching this again, I still don't know what the fuck he was going to do or thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm uh, I'm pretty close to you. I'm giving it four and a half. I'm just, uh, I think if it had, I don't know, it just lacked a little bit of a smoothness, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, some of the uh, the fighting could have been a little better <laughs> well yeah yeah and I, I think if it had just had a, a bit more of that choreographed i think it would have been perfection but it's it's still a movie definitely worth watching just for just for the acting performances how often do we get to say that on the show yeah, that's a good point yeah it felt like we were cheating when when i just see all these people <laughs> here you know like oh it's gabriel byrne and john Turturro and albert finney after some of what we've been seeing lately and what we what we have coming up, we we've earned it. Um, oh, I'm 
dreading next week. And so, what have we learned? Uh, we learned. Um, I'm not. I don't think I really learned much, but I do wonder if a word on his fanny means what I think it means. Ha. And I learned to always put one in the brain. I do. I do like that they mentioned the double tap. I got to give him credit for that. <laughs> well, being an Irishman, Gabriel Byrne. I mean, fanny has a completely different meaning. Yes, I'm over. Okay. And then just, uh, I've been thinking about this this whole review, but I just want to put it out there officially. I'm like more than half Irish. You're mostly Italian. Yeah. I just, I like the irony of that, discussing this movie. Oh, well, yeah. I'm Irish and Italian, of course. Uh huh. No Italian in me, but I'm a little more than half Irish, so. Yeah. All right. So until next week when we'll be reviewing Mannequin, as requested by Jen Miller. Nothing's going to stop us now. Oh, now I'm going to have that damn song in my head. <laughs> you will next week, too. Mm. Until then, go to zombietakeout.com, check out the album art, the episode description, of course, the episode itself, which you're already listening to. Links to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and YouTube. Links to subscribe via RSS and iTunes. Please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. You also find the movie list, every movie we've reviewed so far, and every movie we're going to review, up through, I think it's 210, Blue Velvet. You'll find the request form. If you've got a movie you'd like to hear us review, please leave it on the request form. And the recommendations list. This almost didn't make it until you pointed out the the lack of the protagonist perspective. I was at a 3.5 until you mentioned that. Nice. You can also email us, zombietakeout at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 414-368-ZTO1, or for the alpha numerically challenged, 414-368-9861. We got an email today saying we're going to lose the voicemail if nobody calls in the next 30 days, or by June 15th. I think it took me a few days to see the email. Oh. So if you've been thinking about leaving us a voicemail, please, we'd really appreciate it now. Yeah, we need um, we need somebody's voice on this show other than ours. Mm-hmm. I mean, we like talking and all. Of course. But, I mean, we wouldn't mind sitting back. A little distraction letting... would be nice. Yeah. So, I mean, now's your chance. Mm-hmm. Be a podcasting star. Possibly I, Mr. Uh, Tox will make another appearance. Have I pitched that well? Did I yes, do that did. Right? yes, you did. Okay, good. Okay, good. And, of course, if you do call, always remember that you will always be calling from the middle of Milwaukee. And until next time, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. <laughs> I'm praying to you. <laughs> Look at your heart. I'm praying to you. <laughs> Look at your heart. I'm playing to you. Look at your heart. this part out before we get to this next story um did you see the shot of the alien from this from star wars uh i think i saw like it a, looked like a thing from dark crystal i think i saw like a screen cap of with it, a big yeah. pack on his back okay you've yeah seen. yeah that was it okay this is the story i'm just gonna get into it briefly um okay